everyone try to run to where people need help because we believe once you make one life better your life will be much better than that life a hand that gives is much blessed than a hand that receive so we believe helping is really really need and it is a big blessing Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but you knew that. Hey, guess what I'm going to do today? I'm just going to talk in a normal voice. How about that? No more like announcer voice, just like me talking to you. Hi, how are you? I really appreciate you taking the time to stop by and consume this program that I've put together with the help of my buddy, Mike Carano, the editor, and with my conversational partner, who this week is a gentleman named Josphat Mako. Mako is a safari guide in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. He works for a company called Cotters, which operates beautiful safari camps there in the area. And Mako is a member of the Maasai tribe. The Maasais are the semi-nomadic people that live on the Maasai Mara. I'm going to put pictures of Mako and several of his friends in the Crazy Money listeners group on Facebook. You'll recognize the patterns that they wear. They wear these brightly covered patterns and Mako was a Maasai warrior, and today he's going to share with us what daily life is like in a Maasai village and what his life was like growing up and how people share resources among themselves and with their several wives. That's right. their several wives. We're going to get to that in just a minute. We got a few business items to talk to. First one is I have some comedy shows coming up. That's right. Did you hear me say I got the shot? Did I say that on this one? I've done like eight takes of this already. Anyway, I got the shot today. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling a little superior, actually. The only side effect I have is feeling a little bit morally superior. Hey, don't let me feel that way. Go get yourself the shot. All right? Doesn't matter which one. Just go get it. And then you can join me in feeling bulletproof. Uh, Let's see. This week, oh, I'm very excited about this. This week, March 25th through 27th, I will be opening for the band Collective Soul at the Roxy here in Atlanta. Yes, that's right. Ed and the fellas have permitted me to tell jokes for eight to 10 minutes in front of their show. So by all means, get your butt out there and see that show, collectivesoul.com for tickets. Next week, I will be at Hawks Grill in Roswell on March 31st, April 2nd through 3rd. I'll be on the Best of Atlanta show at the Omni Comedy Club and the Battery. April 9th and 10th shows there, by the way, have been canceled because the Atlanta Braves have a home game those two nights. And for those of you not in Atlanta, the Battery is the entertainment complex surrounding what is now, I guess, called Truist Field, which used to be SunTrust Field, but then the bank changed its name. Importantly, on April 22nd, I'm headlining Mad Life Stage and Studios in Woodstock, Georgia. That's up north part, northwest part of the city. Molly Hatchet plays on the same stage on March 27th, and then I get to perform there a few weeks later. Not sure what that says about either of our careers, but it makes me happy to know that I have some combination with the band behind flirting with disaster. Great. Now somebody's blowing their leaves, right? As I'm on my 10th take of this freaking introduction. I'm going to keep going next Monday night on clubhouse. That's right. We're going to see if we can figure out how clubhouse can enhance our lives. I'm going to do a uh, money and pop culture discussion of the movie wall street. It's a panel discussion with my friends, AM bot, Tony Duff, the author of The Buy Side, and the featured guest for episode number three or four of Crazy Money. I think I just slipped back into announcer voice because I got excited. Anyway, that's Monday, March 30th at 8 p.m. on the Clubhouse. If you need a Clubhouse invite, hey, you can email me at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. You hear that, the leaf blower? If you're a podcaster, you know that the surest way to get your neighbor to start doing his yard is to try to get your introduction done somewhat efficiently. Oh, and this week's episode is brought to you by Sidecar. What is Sidecar, you might ask? Well, the most important part of Sidecar is that it's a product and company co-founded by my wife, Stacy. All right, do I have your attention? Are you listening? Yes, Stacy and her good friend, Carly Faircloth, started this company to help women and men, I suppose, solve the problem of carrying their hats. You know who you are, ladies and men. You are a fashion plate. You wear a hat because it is a tremendous accessory and a tremendous accessory to complete your outfit. But traveling with a hat or even going out in public with a hat can be kind of a pain because you got to use your hands to hold it. Well, Sidecar is a wearable hat carrier that is as fashionable as it is practical. Beautiful leather straps with a gold-plated clip that holds your hat without damaging it. Check it out at sidecarlove.com. What is it? 
sidecarlove.com. The link to the website is in the show notes. If you love me, if you love this program, buy one, buy several. They make great gifts, fellas, for your wife, your girlfriend, your mom, or your sister. All right, let's talk about the Maasai people, shall we? Am I recording this? I am recording it. The red light's on. It was on the wrong screen. Okay, my guest today paid a dowry of eight cows for his first wife and six cows plus three sheep for his second wife. Uh, apparently there was inflation. I don't know. And yes, he has multiple wives, as do several of the Maasai people. Let's not judge. Let's learn about their culture. Josephat Mako or just Mako and his friends grew up in Kenya's Maasai Mara, which is the massive plain, the massive plain covered in wildlife just north of the Serengeti. If you've ever watched some nature documentary and you've seen thousands of zebras and wildebeests running through a plain or through a river, that is almost certainly the Maasai Mara, as he'll talk about. Today, we talk about what it's like to grow up in a Maasai village, who goes to school and their culture. That one's going to surprise you. And what it was like when Mako came to the United States and attended a football game at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It's really an interesting conversation that is a great contrast in cultures, but an exploration of the commonalities we have with our fellow humans. I want to say thank you to Anne Short Travel here in Atlanta who planned our trip, Bush and Beyond and Nairobi, who are on the ground coordinators and the good people at Cotter's Conservation Camp in the Mara. We had a great time. We can't wait to come back. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Josphat Mako. My full name is Josphat Rorat Mako. And Josphat is a name I was given when I was studying English in Nairobi because for some friends of mine couldn't really pronounce Rorat very well. But Mako, the one we are using now, is my family name. So when I came to join Quarters, everyone mm -hmm. would definitely call me Mako. Mako. So I go by that one now. Okay. But my full name is Josphat Rorat Mako. Okay, then I'll say, Mako, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you very much, and I'm glad to be here. Mako, can you explain where we're sitting right now? We were right in the Maasai Mara, Kenya, right on the southern side of the Mara, close to the border between Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, but it is in Rift Valley in Kenya, and we are actually in a private conservation, which is called Oldrikesi Community Wildlife Conservation. And I'm really happy with it and proud of it because I'm among the members of Oldrikesi conservation. So we are in Old Rikesi conservation. What is the Maasai Mara? Maasai Mara, it's a national reserve. It is managed by the local government, but the land belongs to the local community and we actually secure that land for wildlife. So the Maasai Mara is very famous actually because of the migration of wild beasts and zebras, which always migrate in the month of July, August, September. So they come from our neighbor national park in Tanzania, which is Serengeti, to the Maasai Mara. So Maasai Mara is now well known because of the migration of wildebeest and the Maasai because of our own culture. So when people see thousands and thousands of zebras and wildebeests running through a grassy plain or savanna, sometimes that is the Maasai Mara. 100% that is either Maasai Mara or Serengeti in Tanzania, but mainly Maasai Mara because it's a bit smaller. So when they were in the Mara, there are so many because the park is not that big as Serengeti in Tanzania. So in the Serengeti is just south of here? It is just south of where we are now. Okay, tell me about who are the Maasai people? The Maasai Nilotic group, we were originally from southern Sudan. And the history of the Maasai, which is recorded in the book, it's only 200 to 300 years old. But there before the Maasai, nobody really knew where the Maasai are. But for us, we know all of our history because our history is passed by the word of mouth from one edge set to another. So the Maasai are patrolism. We keep livestock and we practice our culture very much. And we live in two countries. We live in southern Kenya. And a small group of us live in northern Kenya, and also we live in northern Tanzania. So we were well known because of our culture, and we fight it to all the tribes in East Africa. So we own almost 40% of East African land. What is daily life like in a Maasai village? Daily life begins by waking up around 5 in the morning, and the first person to wake up is a chief of the village, and he must walk around. 
and pray God. We actually have our own tradition, which is believing in God, but we don't close our eyes to pray or do anything else. Apart from just walking around the corral of your livestock and say, oh God, please bless my family, bless this village. And when a chief go back, he woke up his wife and his wife woke up everyone in the village. So ladies start to milk cows and boys woke up and take cows out for where they will be doing local grazing, like where they get fed better vegetation. And young girls join their mothers to go and collect firewood from the bush, fetch water from the river, and sit down midday to make bracelets for their husbands. So that is, and men and boys take livestock out and look after them and bring them back later. So that is a daily life of a Maasai. What kind of predators are these Maasai boys protecting the livestock from? They protect livestock mainly against carnivorous like lion, including cheetah, leopard, hyenas, all those crazy animals. <laughs> and they protect themselves. <laughs> those crazy as well. animals. They're just <laughs> they, doing their animal thing. They protect uh, themselves as well from other different animals, like elephants. Are there buffaloes? Are there python? Crazy snakes mm. like puffada, like uh, black mamba. So there are so many things out Wait, there. there's black mamas here in oh. the, my camp where we're staying? Exactly. They are black mamas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they learn survival techniques by by other boys who mm. are a bit older than the, the young ones. So when the Maasai boys are roughly five to six years old, because we don't actually celebrate birthdays, even me personally, mm. I don't know how old I am because we don't celebrate that. So we start to look after livestock when we are very young. I told you before, I asked my father how old I am, and he said, I was born in a dry season. But he doesn't know which <laughs> year was that. Which dry season, Dad? I asked him the same question, and he said, e, you must be crazy. What do you mean by which dry season was that? I don't know. And again, I remember when I got my first born, I told my dad, today is my son's birthday, we are going to celebrate when my son was a year old he said you're a big liar that day when your son was born that day end and that day was gone and it will never come back so for us we don't really celebrate birthdays mm -hmm. and you know now we are waiting for new year mm -hmm. i told my dad as well daddy mm -hmm. today is new year and he told me don't lie to me look at the sun coming up the same way going down the same way and everything we have is always the same. So mm. why do you say there is a new year? There is nothing new. So it's completely a different culture, mm. but very impressive. How are resources shared among a Maasai village? Mainly equally, but you know, all over the world, there are wealthy people and poor people. But one really thing I like about our community is that they really like sharing. When you have many cows, and your brothers or cousins doesn't have many cows, you give them some cows for their kids to milk because our stable diet is a mix of cow blood and cow's milk. So when one family doesn't have enough milk and you have, and you know in your heart that the other family doesn't have cows, I could help. And still you didn't help. It's more like a sin. So we definitely try to help whoever who doesn't have enough. But first of all, we look at you, who you are. If you're a hardworking person, it's only that you're not getting it. Or if you're a nice person, and then you get a big help. If you're a crazy person, like you don't even make your family <laughs> happy. So who cares much about you? But we try to bring everyone on board. Like we tell them, the best way to live in a good life is to help. So we try to share our resources very much equally. But people are expected to contribute to the overall stability of the village if they're going to be rewarded with common resources. Well, you mean in terms of when you... Meaning if I don't have any cows, but I don't help, few people are going to help me. Yes, yes. So if you don't have cows, and even if you had before and a drought clear all of them, but you did not help people... People still think of those young kids you have mm -hmm. and try to ignore how crazy you are, <laughs> if you are crazy. <laughs> so they try to ignore and value much about the young kids. 
And also, you are completely right to say people like to contribute. Everyone try to run to where people need help. Because we believe once you make one life better, your life will be much better than one that life. A hand that gives is much blessed than a hand that receives. So we believe helping is really, really need and it is a big blessing. What rewards or benefits does a man with many cows get? Well, first of all, the reward you get is that you will be respected fully enough in the community. And in every age set that your sons are in, like, you have your son in different age groups, your sons will be either appointed to be chiefs of that specific uh, age set or they will be given the most beautiful ladies to marry because... Ladies? Yeah. How many? More than... Well, we marry more than one. Like I grew up in a family of 23 brothers and sisters. 23 brothers and sisters. Yes. How How many mothers was that? My dad married four wives, but only... Four wives got kids. My mom had 10 kids. And another mother had seven and the other one had six. So we were 23 of us. I mean, without the one that died, mm. because there were many died. 24 that lived. 23, we were alive. Mm-hmm. But there were many ones. I don't know how many they are, but they, some of them died. I'm one of six kids, but my mom was pregnant probably 14 times. So mm. Catholic people are kind of like the Maasai in that way. Wow, that is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> except only one wife. Oh, except only one wife. At a but time. In our culture, <laughs> well, when you have one wife, you are a very poor man. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you have Edgeset coming to visit you, Masai are very generous. Mm. When you walk to another place and it happened to be it is night time, whereby you decided to spend a night and then you carry on on your walk the next morning, you will be given a free house to stay. Mm. So they are very generous. So you must marry many wives so that when you have many (laughs) visitors, they will have houses to stay in. And of course, you have visited a Maasai house and you see how small they are. So we need as many wives as you want. But let me just tell you. But hang on. If you have four wives, that means you have four fathers-in-law and four mothers-in-law. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. That and is. they all have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our culture, your mother-in-law or your father-in-law must respect you. <laughs> so, <laughs> you hear that, Stephen Sue? That's Stacy's mom and dad. All right. So it's definitely a different culture. But I'm telling you, my good friend, Paul, before I become a guide and start to understand modern life and start to face it like your country... I used to live, like when I look at long, long distance, where we are now, you know, you can see miles and miles. I used to think that is the end of the world, where the the blue sky end, that is the end of the world. And I used to think our culture is always the best. But we have uh, a say that we normally say, don't just say your mother cooks better until you visit somewhere else. Mm. That other mother might cook better than your mother. So when I went to different places, I realized there are other cultures. But to be honest, I am still extremely proud being a Maasai because there are few things I need to really keep in my culture and few things I need to skip. Okay, let's talk about your visit to America and other places. But first, I want to understand, what was your childhood like? Did you go to school? No, I grew up in a rural place which is called Enkoiroi, and there was no school nearby. And again, even if there was any school nearby, it was really hard for us to go to school by then, because when you are a good livestock herder, your father will never give you a chance to go to school because you can help very well. So I did not get a chance to go to primary or high school because I was a good livestock herder. So I grew up as a very local boy. I went through circumcision when I was around 16 to 20 years old. Which is a group experience. Which it was a group experience and you have to stay uh, still. You don't blink your eyes. You don't move your toes. Otherwise, you will be recognized as a very... I was a very coward warrior, so you stay still, but there is no vaccination, first of all, like mm. uh, a painkiller. No, mm. no, no, you just have to stay there and make your parents oh. proud of you. So <laughs> I went through that, and I become a warrior. My hair used to be very long mm. with the rod oxide, and they are curly hair. 
And after that, we graduated to become junior elders in the year 2006, I remember clearly. And then in the year 2007, my brother, who went to school because of he was, uh, I mean, useless because he was a terrible livestock herder. By then, he was... <laughs> they he, send the useless kids to school. So he was, in, he was working in a company called Christian Partners Development Agency. And 2007, he got some money. He wanted to buy a car. And he asked me if I can go to learn how to drive to become his driver. So he took me to Nairobi to learn how to drive. And after that, I started to see long land cruisers, close to land cruisers, full of white people. And I started to <laughs> develop interest of working with white people. And I asked him, I would like to drive these long land cruisers, which normally come to National Museums of Kenya. I used to stay very close to National Museums of Kenya. So he told me, you can't because you don't speak English. I asked him, is there any way that I can learn how to speak English? He said, yes, there is a school which is called International Center for Tourism and Foreign Languages. He took me there to study English. So I studied my English for only six months. And then after English, I went to study to a guiding for a year and a half. And that is how I become one of Kenya Professional Safari Guide without going to primary or high school. We talked at the beginning of where we are, but we are sitting in a camp called Cotter's Conservation Camp. Tell me about Cotter's and the kinds of camps they run. Well, Cotters is a family that they were from America, but they came to Kenya in 1905. The first man to come was Mike Cotter. So when he came, he went back and bring all of his family in 1919. So they established this company. So in short, the Cotter family have been an eye opener for our community. We were kind of forgotten before they come and set up this camp here. In the year 1996, when they came here, they set up this classic camp, which is now among the classic safaris camp in Africa. And they actually started to introduce conservation to where there is other conservation and teach us more about value of our land and importance of our wildlife. So quarters now have been a strong hands of our community in older case group ranch. And they show us the way of a better life. I don't mean the way of getting out of our culture, but the way of seeing wild animals as very important and seeing also our land has, it has a lot of value. So quarters now, we don't call them like this camp where we are sitting now. I don't call it quarters camp. I call it old Rikesi property mm -hmm. because they have been a strong hand for us. So they run a classic camp which is about, we own this conservation camp and Cotter's Classics camps. And in both camps, we can actually accommodate up to 40 guests. And so white people like me, I'm a white people, as you may have noticed, will come here and what will you do for them? What does a guide do on a daily basis when people come on safari? Well, we teach them all surrounding habitats, including animal behaviors, Birds, insects, trees, show them different landscapes and take a good care of them. Try to show them the, what they really need, like fair animals, like we do have big five, like elephant, buffalo, rhino, leopard, and lion. So we try to teach them more about wildlife and also about our own culture. So today we went to a Maasai village which was really cool experience. What do the Maasai think when they meet white people coming from all over the world and into their villages? Well, someone like me, I understand all over the world, they are poor people and rich people, but that is completely different in the village. Villagers, pure Maasai, think every white person must have crazy amount of money. <laughs> so when, <laughs> when they see you walking in, they think of a very rich person walking in and they expect you to buy some few things. In, but in fairness, it costs a lot of money to get here. I totally understand. But to be very honest, the mass I normally think white people has crazy amount of money. Mm -hmm. So when they see you, they expect for goods, like mm -hmm. uh, buying some bracelets, like what you did. And again, money are very new for them. Like, I remember Stacy bought that face. I mm -hmm. mean, a wooded face. The mask. The mask. 
and she paid four dollars but a lady did not understand so she asked me how much is this if i go to change mm. i said that is 400 kenya shillings mm. she said no i want my mask back because that is very <laughs> less money but she couldn't tell because she can't read mm. and the exchange rate they don't really know very much so few men go and help them to change the money so we paid her what she asked just exactly. For the record, we didn't cheat. The, you, you this lovely lady, we paid. When, her. when I tell uh, Stacy that, she definitely pay what they wanted. Yeah. So she was extremely happy. She said, "Oh, I'm glad you speak their language. How did you <laughs> learn to speak this language? Because my own father, well, my dad passed in June this year, 30th. But there before, he used to ask me, "What makes you interest of studying English?" He always think there is no reason for me to speak English if I can communicate to my entire family. In Ma, he said, no need to study any other languages. But I tried to show them what we call fruits of education. Like I build in a big house, mm. but there is a room and I install big solar panel in my house. So they are nowadays starting to get some small cell phones. Mm. So they come to charge their cell phones in my house. <laughs> and that is another way of showing them fruits of education. Mm. And when I go home, the little money I get, I try to go and help someone who is not able to pay either school fees or bill for hospital. So they are seeing that fruits of education and they are starting to understand. It is very important to speak a different language. You talked earlier about when you were a kid, not knowing that there was land beyond the sky, beyond the horizon. You didn't know where the mm -hmm. sky meets the mm -hmm. land. You didn't know. Is there a Ma word for the other place beyond your territory? Well, the Ma Sai normally say, first of all, let me begin by saying this. You know, the Ma Sai look at all Asians as Chinese, like everyone that is short and has black hair, big hair, small eyes. They are like, these are Chinese. And they also know America. They say America, America. They can't pronounce America. So they call it America. So when they see every white people, they say these people live right in the water, next to the water. They know how to swim. Because none of us knows how to swim. <laughs> so when, <laughs> so they have a word. Like they say mm. other people are from China and other people are from America. Right. But China they call Chinese. So yeah, they have that word. But... That one started, I would say, not very long time ago. So for your work, you traveled to other countries. How old were you the first time you went on an airplane? I don't remember. because Oh, even, wait, we uh, don't know. How, okay. <laughs> but tell me about your first airplane trip. Well, it was quite a crazy experience because I'd never been to an aeroplane. But in the year 2016, the quarters camp wanted me to go to give a speech about our relationship between the Maasai and the Kota family and also importance of conservation and also give a talk about our own culture. So long story short, I traveled to America in 2016 and I have never been to an aeroplane before. What I remember is my boss Calvin Kota telling me, please make sure the plane will not leave you. So when I get to Nairobi International Airport, I walked in and it was right on time for boarding pass. So when it was boarding pass, do you call it boarding pass? When you're boarding? When you're boarding into With the plane. With a boarding pass, the pass yeah, is yeah. your ticket. I wanted to go to the loo, but I couldn't go because I thought maybe if I go to the loo, this plane will leave me. So long story short, we got into the plane and what I heard is this noise of the plane. Whee! like the propeller started mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden the plane starts to took off so my internal my whole stomach is more like going up so it feels very bad yeah so when the plane was in the sky other people start to walk i never knew you can walk in the plane nothing supporting it it's <laughs> above the cloud so definitely it's not something to walk when you are in so people walk, but I couldn't walk. I was so angry because I don't like seeing people walking in a plane that I'm in because I was thinking maybe this plane will crash. I struggled for more than nine hours, wanted to go to the loop, but I couldn't because I couldn't walk in the plane. <laughs> it was so, so scary, man. So we traveled from Nairobi all the way to Amsterdam. I mean, struggling, wanted to go to the loop, but I couldn't. <laughs> so when the plane landed in Amsterdam, 
I call my boss Calvin Cotter and I told him, man, you didn't tell me people walk in the plane. And he said, behave yourself. You're a Maasai warrior. Please walk in the plane. <laughs> so we took Delta Airline to go to New York. When we were in Delta Airline, I said, ah, let me walk. But every time when I was in the plane, I have my back yeah. because I thought maybe people can steal my trousers or anything that is in my back. So I took my back and I walk into the toilet mm. and the plane went through turbulence. <laughs> so I screamed like I have never screamed that much before. I was You've seen lions face I, to face. And I was like, I'm going to die, man. Why? <laughs> what comes into my mind is that why am I going to this country? I'm going to die. Nobody tell my wives. Nobody tell my kids. So I was like, I actually blame myself. <laughs> so when I get out of the toilet, one of the flight attendants saw me looking around. I couldn't, I was freaked out. I couldn't find my seat. So mm -hmm. one of the flight attendants came to me and he asked, why are you wandering around? I said, I don't know where my seat was. <laughs> and I was so close, but I couldn't see. It was 24 was so F. Marco. So when we land in New York, we took my friend came to pick me, Joe came to pick me, and we drove in from where to Manhattan. Mm. So you know there is that tunnel you yes. took when you are going to Manhattan. So that freaked me out again because I never knew there is a way you can build a road underground. How can a human being know how to build a road underground? I Underwater. Underwater, man. I asked Joe why the vehicle is going underground. And he can tell I was freaked out. He was laughing so hard because he's a man I guided him several times. We were family friends. He knows my kids. I know his kids. We become brothers. So he was laughing so hard when we get to Manhattan. I was looking on top of all those tall buildings. So he looked at me and he was like, Marco, how is it? I said, I don't think I can survive here because, of course, a mass I cannot survive in that city, New York City is too much, man. I think of these plain areas, I, I feel like I must go back to my home because it's really scary. So that was my experience in the first time I traveled. Did you take the subway in New York City? Goodness, yes. There is this fantastic good friend of mine. She's a travel agent. Her name is Sarah. So she owns a company called Travel with Sarah. So she took me to Absolute Travel Office to give a speech about what we do here. So we took a subway. So what comes immediately into my mind when I was in that subway is that what if terrorism comes here? Mm. But, man, look at where I come from. Here is where I come from, La Masai Mara. We have nothing like that. So being in the subway, it's more like watching a movie or watching something crazy. So, well, honestly, I did not like it. It was not the subway. Good. The subway was not good. It man. doesn't smell very good, does that, it? Well, and it's underground, man. It's underground. So how can you like something that if if there is an earthquake, you can die easily? So you say a Maasai man can't live in New York City. Can a New York City person live on the Mara? I believe yes, because of our open space. We have lions, we have elephants, and as you notice, Maasai are quite friendly. Very friendly. Yeah. How do the Maasai people want to engage with the world? Do they want people to come here? Do they want to be left alone? How do they want to engage? Do, do they want to do commerce? Do they want to trade with the rest of the world? Do they just want to do their thing? To be very honest, my brother, it's quite hard because someone like me, of course, I like people to come and experience what we are experiencing right now. But other Maasai, they don't even know what are the important of their own land or wildlife. They grew up seeing lions as their enemy because of killing their livestock, killing their brothers and sisters, their parents. So for other people to come in, few villages like the one we visited, they really like people to come and visit. But other places like up in Loita, east of where we were, they don't like many people because they think their land will be taken away, mm -hmm. and they need a space of land to take their livestock for grazing areas. There is precedent for that fear. I mean, there's a lot of native people whose land has been taken from them. They are, they are, actually. But uh, as you know, the Maasai are known for fighting, so they believe they can fight to anyone, but they still feel like we can't let everyone live in our land and take it, because the more people come, the more we have less land. So we will have less land to graze our livestock. Okay, so the Maasai kids 
who are no good at raising cattle are then sent to school. What happens to the Maasai that go to college and become professionals and maybe move to Nairobi? What do the Maasai think of their people that move on to the big city? In about 15 to 20 years, they used to be like not good people in the community. Because when we look at them putting on t-shirts, blue jeans, city boys, we think these guys are gone. They completely leave our culture and admire a different culture. But as right now, things are changing. We are starting to understand professionals are very important. Think of having professional lawyer, professional doctor. They are now very important. But we are trying to engage them, to engage them to make sure even if they were very much professional, they still come back to our own land and come to stay with the community. So they were now very important. And are they celebrated? Are they treated as different? Or do they act different than the people that they grew up with? No. Um, I think I'm a good example. I have been working for this company for many years now. And when I go home, I make sure that everyone does not look at me as someone different. I make sure that I show them I am still myself and I'm still a pure Maasai and I'm proud of being a Maasai and I will never be treated differently. So they always treat people equally. If there's anything the Maasai people want the world to know about them, what is it? Well, there are so many things. Like uh, the Maasai are well known for keeping their own culture. And the Maasai, on the other hand, nowadays, some of the places people are living, drinking a very dirty water. They don't have running water in their houses. So some places get some help and they got some clean water good well for water but not all of the places very few places get an opportunity to get a clean water but for many many places there is no water so for me personally what i feel it's good to be known for the maasai is that they are drinking a water that i don't think any other people who come from the city can handle that because your systems are not used to it so and we never get really sick but uh Slowly, slowly, things are changing. We were focusing on getting a better water. But apart from saying Maasai are very welcoming people, and there was investigation that was done by Kenya Tourism Board, and they said in Kenya or entire East Africa, Maasai are so friendly, and Maasai are good securities because they've never been thieves, and they were quite honest. They never really lie, so... Kenya Tourism Board says there were very, very important people to have in tourism industry. Lastly, Mako, I need to know, how do you tell a white rhino from a black rhino? A white rhino cannot jump, and a black rhino <laughs> jump. <laughs> I wrote that joke for Mako. He can use it. Mako, what were some things about the way Americans live that really stood out as being different to you? Well, there were so many things, but... Uh, the first one, it was, I remember one morning we drove in from Atlanta, Georgia to Alabama. But before we get to Alabama, mm-hmm. we woke up quite early in the morning in Atlanta, Georgia, and we drove in before we had any breakfast. So my friend asked me, we can stop somewhere and grab something and we carry on. We carry on on driving. So I have never knew there is this kind of a house that you go and get close and then you talk on the window like, oh, blah, blah, blah. You give that person a... You mean... <laughs> that is a drive through A drive through <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. And there is no drive through here. <laughs> so we went to a drive through and uh, we talk on the window like, oh, we need this and this. And then we give our credit card. And then on the other side, we pick food and carry on. And that is really simple. I mean, <laughs> it was quite crazy. So you're talking to a microphone on a wall and then you pull around the corner and somebody gives you food. Yes, exactly. And then after that, we carry on on driving and we went to Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And there is where we went. <laughs> Who took you to Tuscaloosa, Alabama? My very good friend by the name Rebecca, Rebecca Heldridge. She lives in America. So we went there and Normally, when I guide guests here, if they need to have some drinks, they can have two glasses of red wine or white wine, whatever they want, but very little. So I thought maybe people in America or England, they don't drink a lot of alcohol. 
until when I went to that Tusculosa <laughs> <laughs> stadium, and there is something called tailgating, and everyone drank very Tail, badly. Tailgating. And everyone drank like some people do not even they can't even walk forward; they are walking <laughs> backwards. <laughs> but again, we walk into this stadium where we went to watch this American football. You know, when when you say football here in Kenya, we think soccer. So when we walked in, I was waiting for something like Arsenal or Manchester United to play. All of a sudden, we started to see these men pushing each other and everyone making noise like, roll tide. I have never seen those many people in my life. So I keep saying roll tide. And if I keep quiet for even a minute, everyone look at me. So I had to say roll tide for a very long time and I had a terrible headache. So it was kind of quite crazy. That's a really unique American. Had you never seen pictures or videos of American football? Never. That was my first time. That was my first time. And what do you think of it as a sport? Did it make sense to you? Uh, well, it doesn't. I grew up as a very local Maasai boy. So we grew up throwing spears, throwing clubs, <laughs> bow and arrow. So I never knew there is a place where people come together like that and spend crazy amount of money just to watch this football. I, well... For me, it was not something that I can use my money for. <laughs> so Maasai boys prove their manhood by fighting lions and fighting each other. And in America, we prove our courage by putting on a helmet and banging against our friend. That's, wow. that's what football does. Wow. For us, that is completely different. You said before you could never live in New York because of how busy it was. What did you think of how people live every day in New York City? My friend, hey, it's completely different. I remember one Sunday, I woke up quite earlier and I went to cook some tea. I prepared some tea for myself and my friends did not wake up quite earlier. So when they woke up, they wanted breakfast. And I did not know that it is something that you can order on your phone. So I think they sent a, an email or I don't know. They ordered it on their tel cell phones. And then all of a sudden, I had someone ringing the bell on the door and deliver breakfast for us. And I was like, what a simple life. But remember where we were in Mass Island right here. When you're walking on a path, you have to stop and say hi to someone you meet. And that show respect and that show you are not like a different person. In New York, everyone walk quickly. And they don't even mind about you. Someone can stamp you and go, but they don't have time to talk to you. So for me, I don't think it is easy to live there because nobody say hi to you. And I feel quite bad when people just pass and they don't say hi. If you talk to strangers in New York, people think you're crazy. Oh my goodness. What we say here, we say we are not strangers. We are just friends waiting to meet. So um, how many wives do you have? I have two wives. And how many kids do you have all together? I have seven kids and two wives, so I'm a family of nine people. Wow. Are you going to have more kids? Uh, maybe. Maybe <laughs> one more. <laughs> because of one thing, in our culture, we believe in numbers. Like number two is lucky. Number four is lucky. Number eight is lucky. So I'm on number seven now. I need to get one more child <laughs> so that I will be on the lucky number. So definitely. What I if you have twins? Then you have to have another. Uh, Goodness, I will have to have another one. <laughs> <laughs> so you said your dad, your dad had four wives. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. How do you make sure that every wife feels that she's being treated fairly? Very good question. As a Maasai man, you try to spend time between your wives equally. But again, they grew up seeing this happening in their families. So they are not jealous. Some of them or few of them are a little bit jealous, but of course they have to respect their husband. In our culture, men are ahead and women are the neck. They might twist you a bit, but still you are the top. You are the one to rule. But the best thing to do is to offer your wives a better life because we say happy wives, happy life. <laughs> we say that too. All oh, right, that's good. That's <laughs> Except good. we say in the singular, happy wife, happy life. And we say happy wives. <laughs> <laughs> Is it easy to make sure that everybody gets their fair share of resources, of food, of opportunity among the wives? Yes, they definitely share them equally. 
But let me remind you something here. I will say our culture is much better to marry many wives because you can't eat polenta with kales every single morning. You definitely need something different. I hope you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you mean. No, you no don't. idea. Marco, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. Highly welcome, sir. And I hope everyone will enjoy. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Josephat Mako, a.k.a. Mako, to his friends. Let's jump right to takeaways. Number one, you know, when you're on safari, the stakes for which the animals are playing any given day really is impressed upon you. It really becomes clear, right? So for an antelope or the prey animals, your job any given day is to not get eaten. And for the predators, your job every night is to eat or go hungry. And so it's a zero sum game for these animals. And on Christmas morning, we saw these two cheetahs eating the zebra foal. And while that in and of itself was interesting enough, what was more interesting was what was going on in the periphery. So on the right over there was the zebra mom watching these two cheetahs consume her child, hoping that the foal would get up and return to her. And spoiler alert, it did not. But you also see the jackals on the perimeter of the kill scene waiting for their share of the leftovers. And every 30 seconds or so, the cheetahs look up checking for hyena because pissed off hungry hyenas will cause a lot of damage to young cheetahs. So the food pyramid is a real thing and it's a zero sum game. For every animal of prey, your job is to not get eaten on any given day. And for all the predators, you know, you either kill or your family goes hungry that night. So it's really interesting. And as it relates to, you know, life in the Maasai village, I think that when your day consists of fetching water, protecting livestock, and not getting attacked by lions or buffaloes, there's not a lot of energy to be expended worrying about superficial stuff. And I'm not sure I'd want to trade places with them, but I bet there's a certain peace of mind that comes with that kind of life that would do a lot of us a lot of good. Secondly, when you're out in the Mara, like one of the things beyond the animals, the thing that blew me away was the landscape. The landscape just went on forever. The horizon was miles and miles, like hundreds of miles away. And you realize how special and sacred unspoiled land like this is and how rare it is in our world. And so As I was leaving, I was thinking, man, I really hope that the powers that be are protecting this place and that somehow economically they can see that the future is about maintaining that special place in the world and allowing people to come and visit it rather than build condos or golf courses on it because it is phenomenal and just not that many places left like it on earth. And I hope it stays unspoiled. Third takeaway is this, go to Kenya go to Africa, go check this stuff out. It's not exactly charity when you go over there, but you're doing good by engaging in commerce with the people of Kenya. The city of Nairobi is beautiful in places and not so beautiful in others. And there's a lot of poverty and sadness. And one way you can contribute is by supporting the NGOs that do charity work there. Another way is going there and supporting the local people and leaving behind nice, generous gratuities. So go to Kenya. Like I said before, the pictures from our trip are in the Crazy Money Listeners Group on Facebook. The link to sidecarlove.com, that's the beautiful, fashionable hat carrier that has been produced by my wife and her good friend Carly. The link to Sidecar Love is in the show notes. If you love hats or if somebody in your life loves hats, please check out sidecarlove.com. Also, tickets to the Mad Life Studio Show, April 22nd in Woodstock, Georgia. The link is there in the show notes. Thank you so much. If you have a minute, rate and review Crazy Money. I appreciate you sticking around to the end. In the meantime, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.